o'clock today. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're uh, trying to get uh, practical vectorization in Julian. Uh, describe what vectorization is and uh, how to try to get it the, the Julian compiler vectorized for you. Parks, did you uh, describe how you got involved in that? Yes, what? Did, did you describe how you got involved in Julia yesterday? Oh, oh, oh. How, how did you? No. Yeah. Yeah, how no, and then Julia, oh, oh, it, 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 it's real easy. It, it, it's internet dating. Um, a <laughs> marketing person asked me uh, was asked me to go look into uh, high-level scripting productivity languages for technical computing, you know, R and Python. So I just Googled technical languages for computing. But <laughs> 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 now Julia and I said, what's this? And I looked into it and, oh, yeah, a type system like that, yes, you really could compile it for efficient code. Um, so yeah, I had a fling with Julia, much to the my marketing person not, not too happy with my running off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, as the scope of this talk is uh, the Julia 0.3 pre-release or the Julia Master. Uh, the Julia, it, none of it applies to Julia 0.2. There's no vectorizer in Julia 0.2. It also does not, does not apply if you use the system LLVM. So there's a bug issue. So you have to either download the nightly or uh, build it yourself. Is that option on by default? It's on by default. Right. Everything is on by default. So I discussed a little, I'll try to explain, uh, give a quick introduction to SIMD hardware. Uh, talk about the vectorization basics. It's really basic because the LLVM vectorizer is really basic. And give my recommendations on getting code to vectorize in Julia and describe some of the future directions or lots of ways the vectorizer could be improved. Right, SIMD stands for single instruction multiple data. Uh, it describes how a single instruction operates on multiple elements of data. It's like doing element-wise operations on vectors or from the Julia viewpoint, it's really doing operations on tuples element-wise. Most hard, uh, modern hardware, most modern hard, hardware has SIMD units in it. Uh, Intel processors for a long time have had SSC that's a has 128 bit wide S, uh, SIMD. Now the AVX that's on 256 bits wide, and the Xeon 5s and the coming uh, AVX 512 have all the 512 bits. They eat a whole cache line in a single bulb. The uh, ARM has its Neon, and the power architecture has its AltaVec and more recently than something called VSX. So yeah, why do the hardware designers like SIMD? Because programmers, well, it actually, to be honest, it's a pain. Um, it's not going away. Uh, there's too many advantages. So the hardware designers like it the same reason the aircraft designers like to take a basic aircraft and stretch it, like stretch 80 or 737s keep getting longer. They take the same basic design and carry more passengers. So here's a diagram of a processor. It's not no processor in particular. In fact, it's more or less resembles a real processor as much as Bugs Bunny resembles a real rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of boxes here. Do various things like we have arithmetic and logic units. We have units to take care of loads and stores. You got a scheduler. It's scheduling all these units. And the nice thing is that SIMD either leaves the boxes more or less unaffected, or just makes them bigger. Uh, the green boxes here are largely unaffected by SIMD. Uh, and the blue boxes, they just get wider. So it's a, for a, a gain in processing speed, it's a cheap trick for, for the hardware. And it's also very uh, power efficient. Furthermore, some of these other boxes actually get other hidden benefits, uh, like the, the caches here. If you did the equivalent design that had uh, a bunch of separate program counters that gave you the equivalent width of a SIMD processor, those program counters might be bouncing all over different parts of the program and sucking in different data into the caches and busy, when the cache gets full, it has to evict something. And so these threads would be fighting each other for the cache. And you have a single thread that's pulling in data that's usually very close together, and it's all happily sharing the cache. Because I keep asking hardware designers, please give me a MIMD machine. I can explain to them how Arch you can't do it. We can't do that. The cache can't take it. Uh, so vectorization refers to the program transformation for exploiting the, the SIMD units. And it's unfortunately, yeah, the word vector is so overloaded in this field. It, this has nothing to do with vector spaces or linear algebra, other than it sometimes makes linear algebra run faster. 
So here's a real simple loop. Uh, I'm going to show, go, go through what, what happens when it gets vectorized. The, uh, that little annotation of at simd is a way the programmer can forcibly or tell the compiler, yes, I'm okay with vectorizing this loop. I'll explain what, uh, show what happens, and then say what, what, what the programmer is really promising there. And then the inbounds is unfortunately necessary right now. So the compiler takes that code and it turns it into something that's the moral equivalent of the Julia code I have here. The, uh, of course, Julia being, you know, the, the function being generic, it's, uh, the code is for a specific instance, for a specific parameter type. So here I've, I've marked the parameter types here float32. And the, uh, what happens in the code is this loop, the loop here has now been changed to loop that eats four iterations at a time. So it's, ste it's stepping through four iterations at a time, and for each iteration it's going to pick up four values, pick up four values from the, the y vector, do element-wise multiplication, addition, and do a, a store. And each time through it's chomping off four iterations at a time. And more or less can do that just about as fast as it can chomp single iterations. Now the catch is the compiler can't do this automatically because there's been a change in the uh, evaluation order. If you look at the, the way the serial loop would execute, suppose they just made all those, uh, instead of the, the temporary variables, suppose they're just scalar variables, and I was executing the loop uh, in a serial fashion. I would go through and execute iteration one all the way through, then execute iteration two all the way through, execute iteration three, and four, and that's the serial order most programmers are familiar with. The vector execution does something different. The vector order is going to basically, I've arranged this as a matrix here, the vector order is going to transpose the matrix. Again, I'm going to show it by, I'm going to keep the elements in the same place, but transpose <coughs> the direction. So the, the vector is vectorized code, essentially it's doing all four loads simultaneously. And then it's doing the next four loads. And now it's going to do all the multiplications all at once, and the additions, and then the stores. So it's just, it's just a transporta uh, transposition of the uh, evaluation order. Now one thing is don't assume that it transposes the entire iteration space of the loop. It may just, tran it often just transposes chunks equal to, well, maybe the width of the SIMD register, or maybe equal to twice the width of the SIMD register, maybe four times. So don't make any bets on what the width is. So vectorization, as far as program is concerned, is just, it's just a transposition, at least for, for Julia's purposes, until we get the multi-threaded stuff. Then there's some other fun constraints. Uh, now, yeah, vectorization is just a, it's a program transform. The, uh, in, any compi in a compiler, there's a bunch of transforms that take your code and transform it so eventually it's transformed into the assembly code for the processor and the processor takes those assembly code instructions and it does more transforming these days. It's, it's scary. Assembly code is no longer the metal. Um, and for each transform, the uh, compiler has to ask two questions. Is the transform legal? Does it preserve the uh, semantics of the program, whatever those, however those are defined? And is the transform profitable? And usually for the first question, if it doesn't know the answer, it has to say no. I don't know if this is legal, so I have to assume no. For the second question, is it profitable? The compiler can just make a bet. As long as it uh, bets, comes out ahead most of the time, most people are happy except for the owner of the program where it was a loser. <laughs> and uh, the compiler developer is here for that person. Uh, and they say, no, honestly, the other 99 out of 100 people, they were happy with this guess. <laughs> So vectorization is a transform, so the two questions, is it legal and is it profitable, have to be asked for vectorization. And there's two forms of vectorization. In, impl in implicit vectorization, the compiler's going to do all answer those questions itself. And so it's either going to, for the legal, is it legal question, it's going to say, well, can I prove this transposition? And I'll show that also or reassociation is legal. Or it's going to jam in some runtime checks that check at runtime whether the conditions are right. 
so that transposition is going to affect the uh, outcome of the program. And if the, if the runtime check fails, it'll go back to the serial code. So that's implicit vectorization. In explicit vectorization, the programmer swears, honestly, really, it's safe. Go ahead and do it. And if it's not safe, you get what you get. <laughs> Tough luck. So implicit vectorization, we wouldn't have explicit vectorization if we could do everything implicitly. Unfortunately, there's cases where implicit vectorization isn't practical. Uh, for simple cases, it is because the, the runtime checks are fairly cheap. Here's an example where the sort of runtime, at a high level, the runtime check might look like I have a function here, and the compiler's not sure if arrays x and y would overlap, and if they overlap, the transposition of the evaluation order would change the answer. So the compiler can insert a simple check. Uh, if the y, the piece of y it's operating on overlaps the piece of x it's operating on, uh, then it's not safe to do the vectorization, and it can just default to a scalar loop. And it needs a scalar loop anyway to pick up any odd iterations that weren't a, didn't fall into the multiples of the uh, simply width. Now the trouble with that check is that it, it can become exp expensive for more complicated programs. Uh, it's often roughly quadratic in the number of arrays referenced in the, uh, the body of the loop. So I've seen LLVM, I've seen Jerry runtime checks for up to, I think it was like four or five arrays. I was impressed. I was looking, all the pa looking at all the pairs, checking. The other thing that's more or less hopeless is like sparse uh, linear algebra codes where you have subscripts that look like you know, W sub K sub I or Z sub K sub I. These are called, uh, if it's on the right side, it's called a gathered. If it's on the left side, it's called a scattered by the vectorization fans. And for those, it's basically impractical to do a runtime check. You just have to check every dumb subscript to make sure it's in bounds. And by the time you're done doing that, you might as well execute the code serially. So the other, I said that vectorization does a transposition. It also sometimes requires uh, reassociation, uh, specifically for reductions. Here's a simple example of reduction code. It sums an array. And if I vectorize that code, the code's going to try to chomp through. You have vectorizing for a, a simply with the four. It's going to try to chomp through four iterations at a time. So what it's going to do is the temporary variable, instead of the scalar here that where I'm accumulating my result, I have a small a tuple here, t, and I'm going to <coughs> accumulate four different subsums each time through the loop. And then after I'm done, after the loop is done, I'm going to sum up the, uh, the partial sums and then deal with my remaining uh, scalar iterations. And now this is just for example, this is the Bugs Bunny cartoon level. That, that, you can't write this in Julia and expect it to vectorize right now. I have a PR for it, but it slows down the compiler terribly. <laughs> so the serial order summation, when we use the diagram, it's a fairly obvious snaking through things. And now for the, the vector order and evaluation, it's got to do something quite different. I'm going to start out with my vector zeros, and then I pick up my first four elements and jam them into my uh, partial sums. Then I'll pick up the next four elements and add them to my partial sums. And then after I'm done doing all my partial sums, I'm going to start doing a, a tree reduction on the, uh, the pieces of the vector <coughs> and pop out the answer. And so here, not only has the evaluation order been transposed, it's been uh, there's been a mathematical reassociation of the addition and commuting of operand to go through the math. So the f if you're dealing with a uh, non-associative operation, you're going to get a different answer. And unfortunately, floating point addition and floating point multiplication are not associative. At least commutative, thank goodness for I triple E. Does that affect the output of the code generation? Like, it said, if it can't prove that the result's the same, will it? And yes, it has. Yeah, it has this. In fact, yeah, here, here's the impact. The impact is that implicit vectorization will not work if you have a flip. Will not happen in Julia if you have a floating point reduction, because Julia is going to is set up so you get the same answer. Um, it's not like Fortran where the, the standard formula says, "Oh, I'll do whatever you want." Yeah. Uh, that will work for it. Say, integer operations do commute. 
and are associative and commute just fine. So implicit uh, vectorization works fine for the uh, <coughs> integer op when, when you do a reduction, but it doesn't work for the floating point ops. So for floating point operations, if you have reduction, you have to use the explicit absinity to force the vectorization. And the absinity tells the compiler, yes, you have license to reassociate the you know, reduction variable. Now, just redu it just gives license to reassociate the reduction variable. It does go crazy and al allow the compiler to reassociate everything. And not implemented uh, floating point min and max. It's a compiler pattern matching issue. It's not implemented. Now, occasionally there's surprises. This was remarked on in a discussion thread. Um, somebody, I think, got a speed up of like 9x using AVX, which has 8 wide register, 8 wide SIMD, and they got a speed up of 9x. That kind of happened. In fact, I tried this on a, a machine at home with uh, AVX. I got a speed up of 12. That's pretty impressive for an 8 wide SIMD unit. Uh, what it is is the, uh, the, the latitude to reassociate summation gave the compiler some extra leverage. What it did is it uh, reorganized the sum and overlapped instructions. Uh, here's an example just using a four wide SIMD unit and for doing a, uh, a reduction. It shows how if I have a four wide unit, but then I compile it as if I'm, I'm synthesizing an eight wide unit from that. So I'm running uh, basically two SIMD streams. One here, the, the script before here is one of the SIMD streams, and here's the other one. I can execute an addition operation here. Then there's a latency between when this operation starts and when it completes, and the next one can start. It's called the instruction latency. And it's about, I forget, it's like probably three or four clocks. In the meantime, you can start up this other instruction uh, addition. And the while it's busy humming, uh, you can start the other one. So they can, they can interleave. And so this is how you can get like a 12x. Because of the latitude the, the at SIMD gave to reassociate a reduction, the speed up can be greater than the SIMD width. So sometimes I think I've seen a reduction case where the compiler actually failed to vectorize it, but did at least to exploit the uh, overlapping instructions to get some speed. <coughs> so there's a joke among uh, compiler writers from the 70s, that the, the vectorizers in the 70s were terrible. They didn't really vectorize code very well. But they taught programmers how to write code that would vectorize with terrible vectorizers. <laughs> and unfortunately, I have to report that the, uh, we're in the same situation, and perhaps even worse. I would say the L of N vectorizer is 70s technology at best. <laughs> somewhat constrained because it's just a time compiler, so you can't do a lot of compilation time studying things. So, yeah, right now with the vectorizer, you can't have any cross iteration dependencies. I'll go into these points in more detail. Um, and the trip count's got to be obvious. It only handles straight line loop, uh, loop bodies. You got to have unit side, uh, unit stride subscripts. And I thought I got a float 64 code to vectorize, but now I can't reproduce it. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, cross iteration dependencies. Each iteration of the loop must not read or write a location written by another iteration. And the implicit vectorization will completely give up on that. And the explicit vectorization with the at SIMD, actually it'll work in some cases if you're careful. There's something called a, oh, it's a, called a forward lexical dependence. It's when you read a location that's, uh, read a location that's written by a later iteration. It works, but it's only by dumb luck right now. It's not officially supported. Uh, let's see. Now, one case where iterations can't depend upon each other is the uh, reduction variables. So that's the special. <coughs> okay. Another rule that's actually fairly trivial right now, Julius, since we don't have multi-threading, is no iteration can wait on another, because the iterations within a, 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 a the SIMD loop is chunks. A, a, a group of iterations are marching in lockstep. In a marching lockstep, you can't have one iteration uh, say acquire a lock, the other ones wait for that lock to be free because they're all marching along in lockstep. If one has to wait, everybody waits. <coughs> all right, in the SIMD spec, if you're familiar with classical vectorization and forward lexical dependencies, forget it right now. Uh, just pretend that it's just all iterations have to be independent. 
And the problem is this, this at symbi is telling LLVM explicitly uh, that basically hijack the notation. Well, it's actually that we didn't do it, they did it. Uh, this notation says uh, within the LLVM intermediate representation that all, all these iterations are independent can be run in parallel. And unfortunately, they, they use that for vectorization even though it's not really what you want. The trip count has to be obvious. Um, if you just use the normal for loop syntax, you should be okay. We had some issues of for loop lowering, but those have been dealt with. And the loop body has to be straight line code. Uh, for the most part, okay, I guess the, yeah, the important part. The method calls have to be all inline, so you have to kind of you have to aware of the capabilities of the Julia inliner. The, uh, the type inference and inline a call target, the uh, type inference has to do its thing. So you really have to understand the, the details of writing type stable code. And you have to turn off the balance check and you can't have anything that might throw an exception. Uh, that also rules out vectorization of division right now because of the, or sorry, integer division because of the divide by zero problem. I'm not sure about floating point division. I mean, there's no exception issue, but I'm not sure if there may be issues with the instruction set. And finally, as the, the exception that proves the rule, um, occasionally go slightly not quite straight line code. If you have really dumb, simple uh, logical and logical ORs or uh, question mark call-ins, they will sometimes vectorize. Well, it's, it's worth mentioning in there the, uh, the if else function, which is a function version of the question mark construct that will that lowers directly to a select. So that might that might help it in some cases. Exactly equivalent to the ternary? No, it's evenly evaluated. Oh, so it's evaluated. Oh, so it's safe to evaluate everything right. in parallel. So yeah, this is basically okay. comes down to, yeah, in this question mark call, and the compiler has to prove that B and C are safe to evaluate before it asks question A. Um, the compiler is trying to inform that the uh, vectorizer can deal with. So here's an example. Yeah, actually, I was trying to come up with examples where it failed. The vectorizer failed, and one of the when you point to the demo, it always fails. So you vector, you vectorize this. Um, so here's yeah, that's a question mark call, and the compiler can prove that it's safe to evaluate these things ahead of time because when well, both arms have the x to y, so the x to y is going to blow up. Uh, it's going to blow up on either arm, so it's safe to do it. So to check whether your code vectorized or not, it's kind of yucky right now. Um, basically, you have to learn to read uh, the skim the, uh, the code LLVM output. Unfortunately, it's, fair, it's really easy to skim the output. Because you have to look for a, you look for a label of vector.body that the vectorizer inserts. And you can also look for these, uh, the vector types are like number times type. So like eight times float indicates a SIMD type of eight floats. And subscripts have to be uh, unit stride. Uh, this example without a unit stride, there's a unit, non-unit stride subscript here, two times i. The uh, compiler can deal with it somewhat, but badly, uh, because the, the underlying hardware doesn't have an instruction to deal with it. So this example, in fact, vectorizes, but it actually runs slower than if you didn't vectorize it. Uh, the compiler basically takes a stride to load and synthesizes the vector stride to load from a whole bunch of scalar loads. Okay, 2D arrays work. You just have to be careful to make sure that your inner loop is the one that you mark as vector and it has to be the one with the uh, unit stride. So since Julia is column major, you want the, the leading subscript to be the one that is on the, uh, the inner loop and that's the loop mark is vectorized. All right, program responsibilities. The uh, yeah, for all the vectorizers, uh, <coughs> implicit, implicit, and explicit. Uh, there's yeah, a summary of the rules. The implicit and the explicit really just differ in that the, the explicit is saving you the saving the runtime check, um, and you're and therefore you're taking response. If you use it, you're, you're taking responsibility. Say there's no cross iteration dependencies. And you have to be sure you don't use local scalars for reduction so that the compiler can recognize it because that special form of a cross iteration dependency um, can be dealt with. 
So in the future, um, well, LLVM 3.5 when it comes out is still limited to vectorizing a single basic block as far as I can tell, but it seems to generate much better code in some cases. So currently it's great, just recently it broke. It broke for Julia. Um, uh, I also have AVX2 support. It's an important structure by doing a, a fuse multiply add. Uh, you know, that's yesterday's discussion. How far in the future is uh, the next version of LLVM? Uh, I think they're saying August can leave. We better fix the CPU and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Future possibilities, uh, there's uh, a bit of pull request. Unfortunately, it slows down the compiler severely, but not a vectorization of uh, basic blocks. There's a whole bunch of scalar math, and we can pack the scalars in the SIMD registers and exploit the SIMD there. I think the L3.5, some of the, the compilation time gets not nearly as severe, so I'll have to take another look at it then. The, uh, I'd love to get the, uh, the inbounds right now is required. I'd love to get rid of uh, that get rid of that requirement and vectorize the bounds checks. So that SIMD specs are written away to allow that. Uh, vectorizing loops are not straight line code would be really nice. Like the Intel compiler now can take like loops that like, take multiple pages of code have ifs and else's and switches and vectorize them. Um, it'd be nice to get LLVM there. It's not as hard as it sounds actually if you have the right architecture. Uh, but of course from LLVM hacking, there's some problems in the IR. Four lexical dependencies would be really nice because one of my earlier examples when I gave a practice run of this talk, one of the interns at the end said, oh, don't you have a forward lexical dependence in that? And like, uh, <laughs> I deleted the line. And it's nasty because it, it, it's a performance hit because I have to run the loop twice instead of, uh, run two loops and alternate instead of a single loop that updates everything. And some diagnostics are why a loop doesn't vectorize would be really nice to teach programmers how to write vectorizable loops by crummy vectorizers. But, So yeah, summarize vectorization just it transposes the evaluation order. Uh, the implicit vectorization, hap uh, vectorization happens sometimes. In fact, sometimes you find that the, the act simply doesn't speed up your code, and the reason is the implicit vectorization already got to it. And so all the explicit vectorization was all that simply got you was saving runtime checks. Uh, and there's a bunch of yeah, limitations of like to remove in the future. If you're interested in taking any of these up this project, I'm happy to hand off the work and describe how to attack it. That's, that's all. <laughs> Would there be any possibility of combining this with uh, like the devectorized macro to, to generate the yeah, I've wondered about that, but I have not looked at the specifics because it seems like yeah, it seems like a natural fit. So why are Float 64 so difficult? Just they can't fit as many in the registers. So. Yeah, only half as many can fit, but I don't understand because the Intel compiler does a quite nice job of vectorizing that sort of stuff, but the LLVM just seems stubborn about the matter. Right? I have to figure out whether the, I mean it, is it. I assume the isn't legal test are passing. I assume, I, I, I've been assuming the isn't profitable heuristics or something <coughs> messed up. Um, what's being done about memory alignment issues? Are you just using a slower load version every time? So um, the, the misaligned loads is a very, uh, these days there's almost zero, uh, uh, there's largely zero penalty for remember right on the newer processors. Oh, there is? Okay. Yeah, the older ones used to have a big hit. You still big hit on Xeon Phi from this line, yeah. uh, but, but for the mainstream, the big, it's all so big core safe, processors. So it's safe just to just use, the, just yeah, use that one now? Right. Uh, what do you do with the leftovers if you don't have? Oh, there's just a, like there's a little scalar iteration loop that runs after the, it's about a remainder of loop that picks okay. up the uh, iterations. And also provides the fallback for like the runtime test case. Is, is there ever is it ever worth it to like pad out your your iteration uh, to make to make it like an integer like an integer multiple of the uh, I, or is that I not? don't believe the compiler is smart enough to eliminate the, the cleanup loop or the remainder. That's actually a common trick on the GPU. Yeah. 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 Okay, I would say no, it's not worth the trouble. Now maybe, the story may be different, get the, the straight line vectorized and you unroll a loop completely and it's like four or eight iterations, only four or eight iterations, the story may change that.
So my question is that uh, Intel is sort of you know somewhat invested in LVM as a uh, technology, but I, I don't know. I mean, they have their own compiler, so this is weird conflict of interest. There. Yes. But um, I mean, what are the chances of getting some expertise from Intel to help with this factorization stuff and improving it? Um, there's there's some hope, <laughs> particularly since uh, LLVM is required to run OpenCL or OpenCL implementations. Okay, that's good. You may, may get some help from OpenCL people in Intel. But OpenCL is pretty explicit. When you write the code in a way that it's easy to vectorize. Yes, but the, co but the key is the code generator is still the same. Yeah. The, the back end part of the compiler, the code generators, shares the same stuff. So if you don't have unit stride, you can't use the gather instruction? If you don't have which? If you don't have unit stride, so you could use the gather instruction? Yeah, you could use the gather instruction. In fact, the compilers will do that sometimes. It's depends. So right now, the gather instruction is not blazingly fast. It's yeah. not a big way that we're doing the sequence of scalar flows. What do you, what do you see uh, about, what was your opinion about like explicit CD types? Where you would mainly do all like the loads and stories. They're, they have some use. In fact, that's my The straight line vectorizer lets you build a little tuple math library where the tuple tuple math becomes simple instructions. I, I find though for large for serious codes it gets kind of messy quickly. Um, but for very specialized uses, particularly if you have to do fundamental cross laning operations where you need to crisscross things, then a the little you know, tuple math works very well. But for general purpose, like scientific computing, the code's get positive really ugly quickly. All right, thank you.